And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the busy intersection of faith and reason where it's always very safe and calm and very interesting. I'm Doug Keck. We're here, of course, at the mothership where Mother Angelica began it all on Mother Angelica way back in 1981, believe it or not. Remember, you're a big part of this program. We need your questions via email, Facebook, Twitter, and also you can check out information on the Magis Center website and then the CredibleCatholic.com as well, both Father Spitzer's wonderful websites. And of course, uh, we're talking what's so special about the Catholic Church, the five graces of the Eucharist, number three, transformation in his image, central to the Catholic system of belief and a powerful, powerful aspect of our faith. Speaking of powerful aspects, we got trustful surrender, stories of grace amidst crisis, perfect timing, by Debbie Giorgiani and Jerry Usher. Always have perfect timing on that particular program. Great with dealing with people on everyday issues and topics. And of course, they'll be on Jim and Joy's show coming up as well at 1.30 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, so people can check that out. Eastern, Debbie and Jerry, of course, from their wonderful program as well. This is a book published by EWTN Publishing. Of course, EWTNRC.com, the place to get all of our great books. And with that, we turn to the the master book writer himself, we're still waiting for the next volume. We know it's coming. It's our own Father Spitzer. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well, Doug, and it's coming out in October. Uh, Ignatius is, uh, is issuing it, and uh, so uh, get ready for uh, Christ versus Satan in our daily lives. I think uh, we've been experiencing a lot of it over the last six months or so, so this <laughs> yeah, sounds like no a kidding. perfect time for the book to come out. You want to lead us off with a uh -huh. prayer? You bet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings upon our country, our culture, uh, uh, our whole world this day. Uh, please uh, guide us in this upcoming election. Please guide us to, um, you know, to overcome this pandemic and its effects on our economy, on the physical health of people. Please, Lord, also help us with this social unrest to uh, move in a state of real uh, reconciliation to, to, uh, to, to a place of peace in this country. Uh, we ask you, too, to send your Holy Spirit down upon Doug, myself, our whole audience this day, so that everything we do will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. Please, Lord, safeguard us, and uh, do, Lord, uh, also bless all those that we talk to. And we ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary's seat of wisdom and Saints Cornelius and Cyprian, pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Very good. And we always uh, remind people as we get into our topic and get some questions that we try to answer as many as we can. And don't uh, give up if you haven't heard our your particular question <laughs> answered. Sometimes it's very similar to another one we have on, but we'll try to get to it. Anyway, you know, uh, there's a lot going out in the news. Uh, we hear things about forming Catholic consciences and things like that. Even some uh, different statements coming from different parts of people inside the church itself. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we hear about is, you know, people say you can't vote for somebody who's, who's in favor of abortion. And then other people say, well, there's the consistent life ethic. And then there's proportionate reasons and things like that. Yeah. And people try to understand... Uh, you know, how you form your conscience and, and what does it mean by proportionate reasoning and what does the term intrinsically evil mean? Can you separate those right. things for us? Right. So what the bishops are doing, and by the way, all of these terms are coming up in the bishop's statement. Uh, they've given uh, what's called a voting guide, uh, which um, you can get uh, right on Google. But let me just explain what's in the voting guide uh, for you. This comes from the United States Council of Catholic Bishops on forming your conscience, uh, you know, in order to uh, uh, move into this uh, election time. So first of all, let's uh, you know discuss what the bishops say and then talk about these various terms you brought up. Uh, mm -hmm. Doug. First, they say that, that um, abortion, the issue of abortion, that is to say the killing of an innocent, is the preeminent issue. So it is the one issue that cannot be compromised in any way. And the reason, they say, and by the way, all other issues 
or the bishops in that voting guide are secondary mm -hmm. compared to this one because it is an intrinsic evil. That's number one. That is to say, it's evil in every respect to kill an innocent. It's the worst thing you can do, basically, if you look at the, the, you know, the Ten Commandments, you go, now, which one is the worst? Killing an innocent is the worst. Abortion is killing an innocent human being. There's no question that it is a human being. It's a unique human being from the moment of conception, from the moment it is a single-celled zygote, whether it's attached, whether it's not attached. It is a unique human being. It has a full, unique human genome with mitochondrial DNA. It is a, uh, you know, a, a functioning, metabolizing, growing, cell-dividing human being, which will become a fully unique uh, uh, baby uh, in, in nine months. And, and so we have to, you know, view that, of course, as what it really is, a human being. And it, that human being, it, you know, has different DNA than the mother. It's, it's, it's not this, you can't identify it with the mother's body uh, because he is uh, or she is different from uh, his or her mother. And, and so different genetically because uh, uh, he or she has the, uh, the, 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 the genetic makeup and the unique combination of it uh, of the father plus a unique transcendent human soul and we've talked about near-death experiences things of that nature which give evidence of that soul not to mention the the evidence of the soul that comes from our faith that comes from the Bible the scriptures so very clearly this is a unique human being can't be reduced to the mother's body can't be uh, you know subjugated to a woman's right to privacy to kill that human being is to kill an innocent so the bishops say hey you know let's uh, you know if we do uh, you know reasoning uh, of this you know what is proportionally the, mm -hmm. the 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 key issue the issue that must be de determinative mm -hmm. of of how we vote beyond any other issue it is the killing of an innocent. That is to say, the abortion issue is preeminent, it's paramount. And that's how the bishops state it. It's an intrinsic evil. Other things, you know, uh, you know are not uh, intrinsically evil that may be, you know, put into the bundle of issues that are really important moral issues that we must be concerned with in this country. But proportionately, abortion is a biggie. And by the way, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, we, we as Catholics, we judge issues according to the issue itself. So the killing of an innocent human being, whether it's one or whether it's millions, you know, is, is still a, a much more serious uh, moral wrong mm -hmm. than, uh, for example, uh, to, to be, you know, even abusive to somebody, to neglect somebody, uh, you know, in, in, in need, etc. I know those things are terrible. They, they shouldn't be done. But on the other hand, abortion is worse as an issue in itself, as, as, as a moral uh, deed in itself. So it is proportionately a much bigger uh, issue. In fact, it's an uncompromisable uh, issue for the bishops, which they state very clearly in their voting guide. Uh, the, the other thing that's really important uh, to see in, in the same regard is you can't uh, put together like a seamless, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, garment sort of a, uh, of a of a of an approach to this because it's not seamless. Mm -hmm. One thing emerges uh, as paramount. But getting back to my uh, my point, we're talking here not just about one death. We're talking about millions of deaths. I, I, I said Catholics don't do counting, but we have to do some counting as just moral agents. We're not just talking about the killing of, of an innocent. We're talking about the killing of millions of innocents, and, and we're talking about every year. You know, so we, we got to stop. This is, uh, what is it now, 20% of the, of the, 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 the uh, um, uh, babies in our country, the preborn babies are, are aborted, uh, 19 or 20%, is that the, the correct issue? I mean, it's just like, what? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't even believe what you're hearing. So yeah, this is a big, big issue. We're killing millions of innocent people on an mm -hmm. annual basis. It has to stop. We as Catholics have to do everything that we can to stop it. There are other valid, much, very, 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 very important issues, but not more important than this proportionately greater offense, both in terms of the issue and, the, and the, just the quantity of direct intrinsic evils that are being done 
uh, we have to basically um, stop it as best we right. can. That's what the bishops are advising. This is not Bob Spitzer speaking. Uh, this is the bishops. Right. You would think at some level that, uh, you know, you can't be helping people later if they're never born. And if you're not <laughs> caring enough about them to protect the most innocent, why would you believe that ongoing you're going to protect those in the future? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Doug. And as a matter of fact, the, the bishops do imply that argument in their voting guide. And, um, you know, in my book, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I have a book uh, basically called Healing the Culture, and I right. talk about, you know, these things. But the main thing is to remember that the reason that we order our inalienable rights as the rights to life then liberty, then the pursuit of happiness uh, in the Declaration of Independence, or in John Locke's case in the Second Treatise on Government, from which Jefferson was borrowing the right to life and liberty and property, and then the pursuit of happiness, is because a Catholic priest, Francisco Suarez, actually a Jesuit, um, uh, in, in his uh, treatise uh, on, on uh, what he called De Legibus, on the laws in 16... Um, uh, 12 uh, basically points out, he says, look, you, you, you know, the right to life has to supersede the right to what he calls self-governance, but that means liberty. Mm -hmm. Why does it supersede the, the right to self-governance? Because if you don't have the right to life, if you are killed arbitrarily, well, your, your liberty rights are taken from you as well. In other words, your liberty rights are a moot question, but it's not vice versa. If I take away your liberty rights, you still are alive. But so, so we say that the right to life is necessary for the very possibility of the right to liberty. And the right to liberty is necessary for the very possibility of the right to property. So when uh, the Dred Scott decision on slavery came out, it was obviously the same kind of violation that the Roe versus Wade decision was. They placed the mother's right to privacy, that's a liberty right, above the preborn child, unique preborn child's right to life. You cannot do that. The same thing with the Dred Scott decision. The white man's property rights, said the Supreme Court unanimously, were more important than the liberty rights of those black men. And, and, and of course, we know right away, alarm bells should be going off proportionally right you know I hate to say this mm -hmm. but the right to liberty is going to be much more important because frankly if I say oh you have all the property rights in the world but I get to own you your property rights are a moot question mm -hmm. because that, that those property rights come along with you who I whom I own mm -hmm. so I uh, are just saying uh, right here the same thing holds true with respect to life it has to be the highest right the mother's right to privacy or liberty uh, cannot overrule in any respect the right to life of the preborn uh, human being who is not the same as his mother independent of his mm -hmm. or her mother uh, as we have already uh, noted Okay, very good. Let's get into some questions since a lot of them will tie into these kind of topics anyway. Uh, sure. As I mentioned before, we do the best to answer as many questions as we can, so we apologize to mm -hmm. all of our loyal supporters and viewers because we don't get around to every one of them, but we will try. Dear Father Spitzer, mm -hmm. tying into what we just got, I'm having trouble with how to cast my vote. The abortion crisis is my biggest concern. Some politicians want no restrictions on abortion. Others say they're personally against it, but is a woman's choice is not pro-choice essentially pro-abortion. How can someone's supposed Catholic faith allow them to permit abortion even if they are personally against it? And this is from Matthew. Well, Matthew, this is the, the, the big question that comes up. I, I probably have to go back a little bit in history to answer your question because uh, there was a, a conference uh, a long time ago um, at the Kennedy compound. I, I'm not sure, I think it was maybe 1968, uh, possibly right in that area, where um, basically the, uh, uh, the doctrines of John Courtney Murray were taken out of context mm -hmm. and basically used to say that someone could form, could, could, could vote contrary to their conscience um, in, in a legislature, that, you, you know, your, your primary responsibility is to vote for what 
you know the the, the you know your group or your uh, constituency, your voting constituency, uh, uh, you know, would want you to vote for, mm -hmm. uh, irregardless, you know, regardless of your conscience. Excuse me. So now the the first thing is is during that conference, which by the way. Uh, th that was a very erroneous conference, but it included a lot of Catholic theologians. Um, I, I hate to say it, and I will just say they, uh, they came to an erroneous conclusion. When you vote against your conscience, right, it's like voting against inalienable rights. <laughs> you know, you can say, my constituency would like to, to vote in slavery, right? And, and let's go back 100 years now and just say, you know, well, you know, the Southern constituency mm -hmm. did want um, their representatives to, to vote in slavery. And, and, of course, they pressured the Supreme Court uh, to, to, to render a decision uh, against Dred Scott, right, uh, to, to render a decision in favor, in favor of slavery. Now, when you look at that for just a moment, you go, well, uh, isn't that what a democratic uh, 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 republic is all about? Mm -hmm. No! I mean, from the time of John Adams, from the time of James Madison, that's not what a democratic republic was all about. The whole point was you, you, uh, you appoint representatives, but the representatives are still in themselves moral agents. You cannot cancel that uh, dimension out. And, and for all intents and purposes, our inalienable rights ride on that fact. In other words, let's suppose that my constituency says that we would like the inalienable rights of black people to be canceled out 100 years ago. Should those representatives have done it? The answer is no. They should have voted according to their conscience because inalienable rights supersede. This is the whole reason the republic exists. Mm -hmm. This is what representatives are supposed to know. They're supposed to know that the republic exists in order to protect the re inalienable rights of every human being living within their domain, whether the Constitution explicitly calls them citizens or not. This is ridiculous that, that, that this should have happened mm -hmm. a, a hundred years ago. And why did it happen? Because because representatives did not vote uh, uh, in favor of inalienable rights. They did not vote in favor of their conscience. They did not vote for what Thomas Jefferson called uh, the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which all uh, uh, people see because they are self evident. Mm -hmm. They should have uh, you know, voted according to what was self-evident, according to their conscience, according to what was moral. No. Uh, what, what happened in Nazi Germany? The same thing. We see that people voted for their, con you know, in accordance with their constituency instead of voting for their conscience letting Hitler through the proverbial gates on the basis of this same erroneous logic mm -hmm. that democracy trumps morality, democracy trumps conscience, democracy trumps inalienable rights, and inalienable rights were fashioned to protect the, the, mor the, the moral decisions, the, the, the uncompromisable moral decisions, right, uh, that, that, that can never be compromised by a plebiscite. Why did John Locke talk about uh, inalienable rights? He talked about about them in the second treatise on government precisely to avoid a tyranny of the majority. Right. A tyranny of the majority occurs when 51% of the populace or more decides to, you know, vote out the inalienable rights of the other 49%. Now, this is what's going on in the abortion issue. This is what the Supreme Court has allowed to happen. Yet again, a tyranny of the majority. And I hate to say it, but during, you know, answering your question, Matthew, mm -hmm. during that conference, I think in 1968, maybe 69, I forget what it was, mm -hmm. during that conference, uh, we basically, they took the, the, the doctrine of John Courtney Murray and, and, and misapplied it to overrule inalienable rights, to overrule the matters of conscience and morality that every, every single solitary representative is responsible to. So what happened in Nazi Germany, it's a false logic, don't you believe it? You know, we do not, representatives do not have to vote their constituency above their conscience, above morality, above inalienable rights. They have no such right to do that. No democracy was meant to trump inalienable rights 
or uh, the, the moral dictates of conscience. Uh, you know, John Adams said a long time ago in this wonderful quote, he said, you know, uh, because we have a constitution, right, that, that will, uh, you know, not prevent us, uh, you know, from, uh, you, know, uh, you know, basically voting out the inalienable rights of, uh, of people because of this, we are a republic that needs religion and moral norms. We mm -hmm. need that. If we do not have it, our republic will not be long in lasting. Now, I, I, you know, I'm not quoting it exactly. I'm paraphrasing it. But I can give the quote to anyone who right. wants to uh, now write into the Maja Center, and I'll give you the exact quote. But this is, Adams is correct. We, of course, must vote in accordance with what we know to be the right thing in our heart of hearts. You can't let a Hitler come in. You can't let a Dred Scott decision happen, and you can't let a Roe v. Wade decision happen. You, you can't just talk about democracy trumping all. It was never meant to be that way. Inalienable rights were put into the Declaration of Independence precisely to avoid it so that people could vote their conscience in favor of the liberty of every human being, in favor of the life of every human being, pre-born or post-born, in, in favor of the rights, uh, of the private property rights of every human being. This is what we were meant to do. Right. So a lot of people will say, well, you know, I listen to the arguments, I listen to the church, I listen to what's out there, I understand what's going on in society, and then I decide I'm, I'm going to be pro-choice because and my conscience seems perfectly fine with that is isn't that a isn't that okay because my conscience thinks it's okay well here's the whole point conscience needs to be formed conscience is not just a feeling yes there is a feeling that accompanies conscience. We feel nobility when we're doing the right thing, and we feel a sense of guilt or shame or self-alienation when we're doing the wrong thing. Yes, there are feelings that accompany conscience, but conscience only it comes equipped, as St. Thomas Aquinas mm -hmm. says, the church tells us, and, and, and so true, John Henry Newman uh, tells us, it only comes equipped with general norms, like don't steal, don't cheat, don't kill innocent people. Don't lie, etc. So we know these things, you know, in a general way. But as St. Thomas says so perfectly, we don't know them in a specific way. We need to form our conscience according to revelation. We need to form it according to the best moral reasoning we can get from the divine law, which is passed on to us in part by the natural law, but also in part by the divine law given to us in revelation. Mm -hmm. So we have to form form our conscience. So it's not okay to feel good about <laughs> killing good old Joe because Joe's been a nuisance. <laughs> uh, feeling good about killing him might just be a good feeling of getting him out of the way. It might be completely, you know, manipulated by the evil spirit who, by the way, really does exist and really does manipulate our feelings on an ongoing daily basis. Mm -hmm. So for all intents and purposes, having a good feeling about killing old Joe, uh, that that's not going to do any good. What we have to do is form our conscience appropriately so that we really know what Christ our Lord would have us do. And if uh, you know, we can't find the precise you know, interpretation there of Scripture, we know that our church will have already done it. That's the whole point of the church's existence over 2,000 years. The reason the Catholic Church has a single church and, and, you know, is because we have a pope. We have a single juridical and teaching authority that can mili you know, uh, mitigate and, and, and uh, resolve uh, all kinds of disputes about the interpretation of Scripture. Mm -hmm. I mean, in 500 years, we have, what, 37,000 uh, Protestant uh, um, uh, denominations, and those 37,000 denominations mostly came from different interpretations of Scripture. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what happens when you do not have an ultimate juridical authority. But Jesus appointed an ultimate juridical authority when he was, you know, came, gave Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I know I, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but <laughs> what I'm trying to say is this. Hey, look, if you don't form your conscience, you're going to have to find a source to form your conscience. But if you don't form your conscience, 
you will be deceived by your feelings. You will think that this good feeling represents the feeling of nobility and doing the right thing. But it might be just a false consolation, as St. Ignatius of Loyola would say, a false consolation from who? The evil spirit who, uh, you know, plugs. It could be your own rationalization from your subconscious mind. The Lord knows I do this all the time. So, uh, I'm, per you know, Spitzer's principle of infinite rationalization. <laughs> Give me five minutes and I can do anything that's convenient to my purpose. So the point I I'm trying to make is, okay, uh, you know, we need to form our conscience. We need to do it very assiduously. We're going to have to find a source. Well, I'm going to give you a great recommendation. Christ Jesus our Lord is the primary source. And when there is difficulty in interpreting this, why not use the, the source that Christ Jesus gave us when he said to Peter, you know, I tell you, Simon Barjon, no flesh and blood has revealed this truth to you, but my heavenly Father. And I say to you, you are rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall never prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That's the keys to, prime minister, to the prime minister's office. Jesus is forming an office here. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The prime, Peter's going to be prime minister of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Whatsoever you declare uh, bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you declare loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What words do you need from Scripture any more than this? Christ gave this ultimate teaching and juridical authority to St. Peter and to every single successor of St. Peter in the office of prime minister he created at that moment. Now, all I'm telling you is, why not choose that source? And if it is the source, then read your Catholic catechism to form your conscience. Read the bishop's voting guide to form your conscience. A good feeling ain't enough. Uh -huh, right. You're going to have to have... Uh, a, a, a good, well-informed conscience uh, giving that feeling to know whether something is good or whether something is evil when you feel shame and guilt and self-alienation. That's when it becomes very meaningful. That's when it becomes, the, the, you know, the conscience of a good Catholic leader and a good Catholic citizen. Right, exactly, and that's where sometimes our avoidance of suffering and also uh, our avoidance of responsibility and accountability yeah. is there as we're trying to avoid that or, or, or mm -hmm. avoid uh, negative impact on our career or people uh, criticizing us. Yeah, yeah, here, yeah. Here's, a, here's another question for you, Father. Dear Father Spitzer, now I understand and agree that abortion is a horrible act, but why do so many in the church continually focus on the horrible action and the evil that's, that is committed? There are women had an abortion in their past, they've regretted the decision every day since and crave forgiveness. The continued condemnation by the church makes it sound like abortion is not forgivable and these women are damned. Please help me understand Anonymous. I think uh, there's a, a lot okay. of misunderstanding here. Now, Anonymous, the reason for talking about this is because millions of lives are still being lost. Mm -hmm. So we have to emphasize the gravity of the sin that's being committed here. Uh, remember, we're up against a propaganda effort on the part of the culture that is trying to rationalize this at every waking moment. Millions of dollars are being spent, not just by Planned Parenthood, by m mass media organizations, I mean the majority of them, being spent on perpetuating this myth, this lie. And, and so, you know, if we don't say something, Anonymous, I'm telling you, uh, Who's going to say it? Should we be guilty bystanders? Should we remain silent to the holocaust of the millions of, of pre-born innocent human beings that are butchered every day? Should we remain silent? I say no. We cannot remain silent. Now, with respect to protecting the, these poor women who have been, and I think many of them, have been victimized by the propaganda. They bought the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the myth. They went in. They had the abortion. And all of a sudden, the, the pangs of guilt, it suddenly occurs to them what they have really done. They have killed their own offspring. They, they've committed a kind of infanticide. They know. And, and they're bothered deeply in their conscience. There are many really good programs. And, and what I'm going to say is the solution to the problem is not to stop talking about the gravity of, 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 of the sin of, of, of abortion. The, the problem, it, it, the, the, the solution to the problem is to go to Rachel's vineyard.
or to go to um, uh, several of the other really good post-abortion uh, uh, counseling programs and you can read about them just go to Google and put Catholic post-abortion counseling programs. You will see about three or four of them uh, uh, that are very, uh, you know, they're all over the United States. And what you do, if you go to Rachel's Vineyard, I believe, and uh, some of the other ones that are um, there, they have a map of the United States and they can tell you mm -hmm. the exact, you tell your locale and they'll give you the counseling center where you can go and, and really get this counseling. So we don't want to leave those poor women, you know, feeling guilty guilty and, and feeling, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, experiencing an alienation in their lives beyond compare. But the solution is not to remain silent about the terrible atrocity that gave rise to this problem in the first place. Absolutely. So in other words, why would we want to perpetuate those poor women who are experiencing post-abortion syndrome? The way to do it is to stop the problem and and w with every breath of right. uh, of our being we have to be like the abolitionists we can't say well gosh those slave owners you know they're going to feel guilty at, you know post factum and i'm sure many of them did when they discovered you know the, the the atrocities that they had really done but the problem is you got to stop the atrocity first right. and that's what the catholic church is trying to do we're not trying to make people feel guilty we're Absolutely, just and as yeah. and as so many things in the culture, we always talk about prevention, 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 and that's what we're really talking about. With that, yeah. we're going to take a break here, talking with Father Spitzer about very powerful, important issues of the day. Stay with us. Much more ahead. And thank you so much for staying with us here in Father Spitzer's universe. Wanted to remind everybody, since Father Spitzer and I were talking a little bit about what's going on, uh, especially in the United States with the upcoming election, we want you to be prepared, of course, and so you can go to our EW10 website, ew10.com forward slash vote for a, a wonderful voter's guide that's been put together. And so it'll give you an idea of what the Catholic perspective is on that. Also, you know, a lot of people sometimes will write us and ask us, well, what Mother Angelica think? And, you know, we don't want to put words in mother's mouth at all, so we'll just put what mother has said before in the past. And one of the things mother said is, I heard today that we are awesomely selfish for fighting abortion. So it means that anybody's conscience, as enlightened as it is may be, is more important than a baby torn apart and burned black. So if you wanted to wonder what Mother Angelica thought about these issues, you may want to contemplate on that particular comment. And with you, we'll turn to Father Spitzer, and we'll continue talking about these particular topics and uh, talk about uh, the next question here. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, where is the line drawn for bishops and priests to advise their flock on voting? I see a lot of disagreement in the news about voting for or against pro-abortion candidates, as we've talked about, and whether other positions rise to the level of a candidate's view of abortion, which we talked about. Can they offer a personal opinion as to who they would vote for? So, you know, we get into issues of endorsement, and then we also have the whole issue of the understanding of the separation of church and state. Yeah, well, here's the, the basic uh, uh, rule. I mean, if they're speaking from the pulpit, they can't use a name like Trump or Biden. Mm. So one way or another, right, they, they, from the pulpit. However, can they read the entire voter's guide that the bishops have prepared? Yes, they can. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I have to tell you, if you just rationally sit there and reflect for five seconds on what the bishops are saying, you'll figure it out. I mean, basically, the bishops are trying to help us order our conscience in an appropriate way that first positions the intrinsic evil that's being done to millions of, of, of babies on, on an ongoing basis, and, and they position it in first place. They 
position things, cor uh, the other issues correctly and in a, a sort of an intrinsic order of, of priority too. Uh, not, not a strict one, but you know, they, 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 they take a look at what those other prioritizations are. But it's pretty clear what our uh, voting responsibilities are. Now, if I were, you know, sitting down at dinner with you and just basically saying, okay, you know, somebody says, well, who would you vote for? I mm. might say uh, who I would vote for um, uh, explicitly mm -hmm. and, uh, and argue the position uh, with that person at dinner. But would I say that on here on EWTN? No, I wouldn't. Uh, would I say it from the pulpit? No, I wouldn't. I would try to uh, observe the appropriate, uh, uh, you know, uh, regulations. That, that we have in our own uh, code of ethics and also in our, uh, you know, uh, uh, strictures, uh, you know, that, mm -hmm. that we have uh, uh, within the, the, the confines of the law. But uh, again, we have a voting guide, and that bishop's voting guide is perfectly public. Mm -hmm. uh, any priest can speak to it. Any priest can reason from it. Any priest can give those rules out and, and just beg their flock to follow what the, the, the advice of the bishops is. Mm -hmm. And so that's a perfectly permissible and good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you, why do you think, considering what you said, it, I mean, it seems like it's pretty straightforward, the intrinsic mm -hmm. evil, the importance of it, the death of the unborn, mm -hmm. which leads to the yeah. euthanasia, which leads mm -hmm. to virtually, you know, infanticide on the other end, which yeah. is what mm -hmm. we're looking mm -hmm. at these days, really. Yeah. Uh, why there's so many people who seem to not want to just see that and keep seeming to obfuscate the issue or blur the issue. Why do you think that is? I think, honestly, it's to protect the platform of a particular political party. Mm -hmm. um, I have to tell you, I think it, it's in many ways very political. Mm -hmm. I can see that many people are attached to that political party. I, mm -hmm. I can see that. Um, you know, on the other hand, I, I have to tell you, you know, you, you have to vote that issue. It's really critical. Uh, I just don't think the, the, the people who allowed Hitler to get through the, the door, uh, do I think they're culpable? Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. you, know, <laughs> you know, I have to tell you somewhat passionately, yes, they're culpable. You know, I mean, uh, you know, what ha I mean, he, he had all this in writing, in Mein Kampf. Right. You know, I mean, uh, uh, it, 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 you know what's going on. I mean, do, do I think that the people who allowed the, the, the travesty of continued slavery and the, the Dred Scott decision, the Supreme Court justices were culpable? Yes, I think they were culpable. They, did they, should they have known mm -hmm. that what they were doing was, was committing a, a horrible, erroneous act? You know, to, to sit there and try to, to, to feign like it was really important whether or not the Constitution specifically protected the liberty rights of black men. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? I mean, uh, this is a per perfunctory issue. You know, I mean, uh, what are we talking about here? The, 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 the rights of black people, they're people. You know, number one, they're unique human beings. Of course they are. Whether or not their rights were specifically and their citizenship was specifically protected uh, by the Constitution is, is irrelevant. And furthermore, it's an, er an error of, of trying to misinterpret silence. Silence only means silence. It doesn't mean yes or no. And the Supreme Court, both in Roe versus Wade and in Dred Scott, went ahead and said, oh, look, are there fetal rights protected under the Constitution? Oh, there's not sufficient precedent to, to say that. Therefore, we interpret the silence of the Constitution to mean that the fetal rights are not protected. What are you kidding me? I mean, uh, you know, it's the same logic in Dred Scott. You know, uh, here we see, you know, oh, oh, let's look in the Constitution to see whether the, the, uh, the, the, the citizenship of black men and women are protected under the Constitution. Whoa, they're not. Therefore, black people have no liberty rights, and said the Supreme Court unanimously. Therefore, the uh, liberty rights of black men uh, uh, are uh, to be subjugated to the superior race. I kid you not. This is in writ. This is in the unanimous Supreme Court decision. Now, you look at this and you go, this is a complete misinterpretation of the notion of silence and evidence. Yes, it is. And, and and what, why was it done? Political. 
That's what I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. This stuff is political. Are these people culpable? Yes. Did they know they were committing an error under the rules of evidence and the law? Yes, they did. Yet, of course, it leads us right into a civil war, you know, um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know and among other things, you know, we, uh, there are so many other r rational, you know, problems in the Roe versus Wade decision, the Dred Scott decision, which I'm not discussing here. But yes, I think there's culpability. So yeah, let's not be guilty bystanders here. We right. are responsible. There's a Holocaust going on here. Let's not turn a blind eye to this anymore. You right. know, I'm, I'm sorry to get so passionate about it, but I mean, if somebody doesn't speak out, right. you know, that this is this is wrong. It's, you know, I don't care whether they're in the womb or not. And you, nobody can claim slippery slope argument you know, is, is false. Slippery slope is already happening. Are you kidding me? What evidence do we need beyond the governor of Virginia basically Basically saying, well, you know, this and, and this infant has now been born, you know, uh, and and uh, you know, let's have a discussion with the parents as to whether we should let that post-born infant die. Right. We're already discussing uh, infanticide beyond Peter Singer. Mm -hmm. You know, are you kidding me? I, I mean, it, it's already happening. What are you talking about? The, the head is partially protruded uh, from uh, the woman, and now, uh, you know, whether the head is uh, three centimeters or ten centimeters out of the womb, are you kidding me? Crush the head because it's only three centimeters outside the womb? Are, are, what, what are we talking about here? Well, what kinds of, you know, the slippery slope has happened? Uh, I mean, let's call it what it is. And then to, to sit there and go, great, we've protected the right to kill a baby protruding from a woman's womb. And, 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 and we have protected. Let's turn on the pink lights and celebrate mm. that we are now right. going to kill these infants. Which I'm happened telling in New York, you, it's right, it, 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 right, right. York, exactly. Right. Slippery slope is here, ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen, let's quit pretending that these are even doubtable, uh, you know, problems. Right. They are real problems, and it should stop. Right. And hopefully, it will and stop now. Right. I don't think we got a slippery slope. We got downhill these days. I mean, it's downhill. <laughs> I mean, Down, uh, yeah, downhill and we're, skiing. And we're, yeah, right. yeah, exactly. It's, uh, so I think we're we're past that. Let's talk about the topic yeah. so we can move forward with that. Talking about Sorry. the Eucharist. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, you talk about in this section on the Eucharist, you say the reconciling power of Christ's body and blood is not limited to forgiveness and the cleansing of sin. It also heals souls which have been adversely affected by sin. The healing power of the Eucharist has been long attested to by those who have benefited from emotionally, physically, and spiritually. So if we're, if we're healed through the Eucharist, why, why do we then later on, and, and we'll talk about this later, need, uh, you know, uh, like healing through reconciliation or something? Well, normally, you know, um, if we're talking about a serious sin, you do need healing through reconciliation. And both sacraments do give healing, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got uh, the, the reconciling, um, uh, a sacrament of reconciliation does do healing. And the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist uh, uh, obviously does do healing. And so um, um, you say, well, I, I, I really, you know, I've, I've gotten absolution. Why would I need healing? Oh, mm -hmm. because we do so much damage to ourselves. We do damage to our consciences. We, we really do damage to our souls. I mean, we don't, you know, when you, you've been, you know, kind of caught up in a mode of sin for a long time, it's amazing the, the layers and layers of rationalization, mm -hmm. the ways in which the, the, the evil spirit has really sunk his tentacles into us and, and, and or his, you know, his claws, really. He's got us gripped, you know, and, and so we are uh, really, uh, in a sense, uh, um, you know, captured, even though we are forgiven, even though we're on the road back to Christ, he's still got that yanking power from those uh, tentacles. You know, he can pu pull us back in, you know, very easily. The rationalizations are there. The conscience is weakened. Well, how do you strengthen that? Well, believe it or not, you get grace in the sacrament of reconciliation. You get grace in the frequent reception of the Holy Eucharist that actually heals that and breaks the grip of the evil spirit. And you say, well, well, what's your proof? I'm the proof. 
I've been around the block a few times, mm -hmm. and I have to tell you, you know, I wasn't always in, this, in the seminary, you know, or in, in the priesthood. I, you know, there were times when I kind of would almost give myself over to utilitarian wealth formation and power, mm -hmm. you know, before, you know, I, I, and I had a lot of rationalizations for this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people didn't like it in me. You know, my friends would actually say, you know, Spitzer, you're, you're kind of a, you know, a, and a, a bit of a utilitarian, you know, uh, and I go, what, what are you talking about? I, it's Otherwise known as a user, my right? right? Uh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, so uh, for all intents and purposes, I needed the grace of the Eucharist right. in my daily mass, and and the grace of the of the sacrament of reconciliation. And eventually, you know, it, it, so much of the clouds in my conscience started to, to to lift, and I began to see, oh my gosh. What have I done? You know, what mm -hmm. am I thinking? What am I doing? And of course, even still, it's hard. You, you recognize the rationalization, that's step one. Then you have to sort of break the spell of the rationalization because you go back to it like a feeding trough sometimes. Right. Right. And, uh, and it takes a little time to, to get over it, but the grace of the Holy Eucharist is there. I'm, I can testify this. Yeah, the grace of the Sacrament of Reconciliation is there. I can testify to this. It does break the spell. And even, you know, gross utilitarians like me can come out of a, the spell and, you know, reform my life and do something a little better with it. So just... Uh, uh, I want to, you know, personal witness. I know a lot of other people too who've been in the same boat, and have, you know, the Eucharist and the Sacrament of Reconciliation really helped. Now, our Lord told, you know, used the quote from John about abiding in Me and I in Him, and you say the idea mm -hmm. of one person living in another is the highest possible form of intimacy, far exceeding living with another. Jesus intended that we enter this highest possible mm -hmm. intimate relationship with Him by receiving Him. The, his body and blood, the Holy Eucharist. If he did not intend this, the expression living in would be virtually inexplic inexplicable. Inexplicable, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. It, well, yeah no, the, it, well, I was trying to refer to is you know how it is when you're, you're, you hang around a person, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I have a wonderful assistant, Joan Jacoby. And I, I'm hanging around her day in and day out, and <laughs> she's got the, the listening ear. She hears the cry of the poor. I'm, I'm not kidding you. She, mm -hmm. she really does have a heart of compassion that, that goes beyond compare. And so uh, I'm hanging out with her, and I can tell just by what she's saying to people on the phone or how she reacts to people who sometimes, you know, I get the idea this person needs help but I just don't have that automatic empathy. Mm -hmm. Well, after hanging around with her for nearly 11 years, or now 11 years, uh, it, you know, it's rubbing off on me. <laughs> now, I'm, I work with her, uh, you know, and, you know, the next step up is, you know, if you were living with a person, you'd, they'd rub off on you even more. So we're talking about Christ now. So if I'm living with Christ, wow, he's rubbing off on me. And now, if he's living in me, Wow, his heart's really rubbing off the way, you know, that, that things work. You know, you, you, you see how things, you, you know, there are people's habits, people's ways, people's compassion, people's, you know, their good characteristics just begin to rub off on you. And Christ is, as, a, as we might say, full of good characteristics to the point of overflowing. And if we start hanging mm -hmm. out with him and even in him through the Holy Eucharist, he starts rubbing off on our hearts. Mm -hmm. And he really makes a big transformative difference. And so that's what I just meant. I mean, this term ab abiding in mm -hmm. is such a powerful term. It kind of sort of slips by you when you're mm -hmm. reading it sometimes in John's Gospel. But it's very powerful. It's even more powerful than living with him. I I'm, I'm living in him, and he's mm -hmm. living in me. Wow, that's you, a thought. You also make mm -hmm. the point here, he will not do this in a way that undermines or overpowers our freedom but in a way that yeah. respects our freedom. That's right. Well, so, in other words, even though he's present in me, he's not going to go against what he knows to be, you know, what I would have him do, mm -hmm. right? So there, you know, I, it's a gradual process. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, he sort of lifts up the, the shutters a little bit, you know, and a little bit more light comes in. I go, oh, my gosh, you know, I got to deal with this, too. And, of course, mm -hmm. the, the answer is yes. And that's why, by the way, St. Ignatius says the examine prayer for Jesuits is not going to end until you die. 
mm -hmm. because there's always more light that's coming in. The shutter's going up a little bit more. You see more deeply you know, what's going on inside a person's heart, mm -hmm. you know, and so we want to make little corrections and so forth, uh, you know, what's going on in our hearts. And so for all intents and purposes, we, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Christ being in us, he respects that, mm -hmm. you know, that we can't just take it all in one fell swoop. And we wouldn't take it all in one fell swoop. We, we, he couldn't take it all in one fell swoop. There's just too much to, right. uh, depth to, to be done. So he does it gradually, but he keeps us hooked in, as it were. Mm -hmm. And the more we receive the Holy Eucharist, the more he keeps, he doesn't, you know, uh, let up. And, you know, for me, it's mm -hmm. always three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, so I get awakened and I go, Hmm, what do I need to pay attention to? Now, sometimes it's just like he's given me something for the book, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm writing a book or something, and he'll give me a uh, direction or something in the organization, and he gives me a direction. Okay, you know, I'm going to follow you. But sometimes it really is, uh, I've just got a new insight for you here, Spitzer, mm -hmm. and here it is, and it's, yike, you know, uh, i, I got to concentrate on this now, and it's okay. Right. You know, I don't get upset. I just go, okay. Um, all right, I'll just keep a cool head here, and I'm going to try and work on this. But I always say that prayer of the publican, have mercy on me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Mm -hmm. And I, I can see more clearly where the sin is. And by the way, when you see more clearly where the sin is, oftentimes, you know, and I, this happens to me in my life, I look back and I go, oh, my gosh, you know, when I was in high school, did I, when I was in college, did I do this? And the answer is probably, mm -hmm. you know, and so I got to reconcile that. But, you know, I know the Lord has forgiven me uh, through the sacrament of reconciliation. You know, he, I, I could only see so deep and he forgave me uh, all the way, even though I couldn't even see how far all the way needed to be. So, um, but God keeps, he's just abundant in mercy and he keeps healing us and he keeps transforming us. And the process is wonderful because we really do become as it were, more innocent right. than we were uh, when we were younger. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, um, that's my life story. Now, you also mentioned as we receive the Eucharist, we become more tightly bound to the community living in and through Christ. Mm -hmm. And you talk about a twofold mm -hmm. effect. So, so how does that connect? How is it having him abide in us or uh, us and him lead to a mm -hmm. closer relationship with the community? Yeah, it's like the com the community means the not just my church community, but the whole communion of saints. Okay. And so St. Paul tells us right in the first letter to the Corinthians and also in the letter of the Romans, you know, hey, everything we do, right, influences the whole uh, communion of, of uh, not just the communion of saints, but the whole church community, the mystical mm -hmm. body of Jesus, and vice versa. Uh, everything that uh, is going on with the body is affecting us. So as we receive the Eucharist, you'll notice that sort of, well, the Lenten season comes more alive in you. And the more you, you sort of, uh, um, you know, receive the Holy Eucharist, the more it, it means to you uh, in your life, you, if you're open to that. And the more the Christmas season means to you and the more you sort of celebrate the joy of that season or the joy of the Easter season it just comes more and more alive to you it's almost like the the communion of saints is uh, you know kind of coursing through your veins the joy of the communion of saints and I use that mm -hmm. line because my mother uh, used it on me when I was uh, phew, I think I was about 12, 13 years mm -hmm. old anyway I didn't have my driver's license yet and we'd still go you know to, um, uh, to mass together uh, for Christmas and mm -hmm. so uh, you know I'm going to mass and I was feeling really really joyful mm -hmm. and I didn't know why I said you know mom I just feel so joyful today she said well you got all the presents you wanted I said well not that it's mm -hmm. not that you know she, she thinks oh you know maybe it's the family so she says oh maybe you're just enjoying the family more and more and I said well we got a great family mm -hmm. and I love my brothers and sisters and I love you guys but I mean my mom and dad but uh, mm -hmm. no that, that's not it and she thinks she thinks she goes well, maybe it's the joy of the whole communion of saints coursing through your veins at Christmas. Mm -hmm. I said, that's it. You know, that, that's, that's what's making me happy. I'm just sort of, you know, everybody around me is happy, and so mm -hmm. I'm happy too. And uh, I've been linked in with the communion of saints, and this is happening through the Holy Eucharist, and I get to experience the whole deal. And so um, anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's basically the... Uh, 
the story there, but yeah, we, we do. We get into the church, and the more we receive the Holy Eucharist, the more Catholic means to us. Mm -hmm. You know, the more the church means to us, the more looking at the saints means to us, the more the seasons, of the liturgical seasons mean to us, the more, you know, I mean, we just, it suddenly becomes so important. It becomes almost like a first priority. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the questions that one of my, you know, interviewers, when I first decided to, you know, apply for the Society of Jesus, he said, well, wh why are you applying to the Society of Jesus? I said, well, the first reason is my religion is more important to me than anything else in my life. Mm -hmm. That wasn't always the case, mm -hmm. but it is now. And, you know, I, I look back and I think, well, how did the transformation happen? Well, of course, it happened because of certain decisions I made, and it also happened because, you know, I got a little evidence for God. It also happened because I started going to daily Mass mm -hmm. and started receiving the Holy Eucharist and started hearing those homilies. But above all, the Holy Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist was transforming my heart. And the next thing I know, theology meant something to me, Scripture meant something to me, you know, wolfing down St. Thomas as much as I could get of it. You know, I, I was just thinking, wow, you know, this is great stuff. And, you know, I, I'm hooked in and I'm looking back on my life going what happened mm -hmm. the Holy Eucharist the grace it hooked me in I became part of that community the, my religion became more important to me Catholic Church became more important to me than anything else I became sort of this little defender of the Catholic Church I used to be when I was kind of in the ninth grade in high school everybody said you know talk to Spitzer he's the religion guy <laughs> you know and I was always really truly I, I was really kind of the Catholic spokesman and then I kind of I had a little uh, I, not, I didn't get, go away from Mass, but I had a dip with some doubts. Mm -hmm. A lot of things happened to me because I read a lot of existentialist philosophers. But the long and short of it is I zoomed out of it, you know, by, uh, by going to daily Mass, by, by just getting some evidence for God and things of that nature. And I zoomed right. out of it. I kind of became uber Catholic, you know, the right. uh, super well, a Catholic. Are, you know, and, a lot of us are Zooming yeah. these days, you know, as we stay in touch with one another. Unfortunately, we <laughs> yeah, got to Zoom right. because we're... We're just out of time oh. there, Father, so if you'd like to give us your uh, blessing, that'd Absolutely. be great. Absolutely. Bow the door. your heads, pray for God's blessing, and may the Lord of heaven and earth, the Lord who is part of the whole body of the church, indeed the Lord who is the mystical body of the church, bless you with that sense of holiness, that deep sense of mystery and sainthood throughout the ages that just spells our redemption and the goodness that he holds out for us and the joy he holds out for us in freedom and in love. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, as always, Father Spitzer. Stay well. We shall see you next week. And remind all of you about Father Spitzer's wonderful books and videos, all available through our EW10 Religious Catalog. Next week, we continue on with our topic about the five graces of the Eucharist. And this week, and on bookmark, Will Wilder, The Amulet of Power by the one and only Raymond Arroyo. Check that out. And don't forget that be sure to join us next Tuesday, September 22nd here on EW10 as we bring you the Solemn Mass in honor of St. Padre Pio, live from the shrine of St. Padre Pio Petlicina in San Giovanni Rotondo, Italy, right here on EW10, 6 p.m. Eastern. And next Wednesday, Father Spitzer's Universe will air a little bit later, about an hour later at 3.30 or so. EW10 uh, will bring it to you via Eastern time because we've got an ordination and installation of the Reverend Stephen J. D. Parks as the 15th Bishop of Savannah. So look forward to that from the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist in Savannah, Georgia, 1 p.m. Eastern. Look forward to that, and we look forward to seeing you next time in the heart of Father Spitzer's universe at the busy intersection of faith and reason. It keeps you thinking. We'll see you next time.